Hi, guys. How many people know what underall means? OK, what does it mean, really quick? Andril is Aragorn's sword from The Lord of the Rings, Narsil okay. Reforged. The Elven translation is the Flame of the West. Great. OK, so this is what the company is named after, just for everyone's education. Um, I want to start, because last time we sat on the stage together, you, were, you, had, you founded Oculus. You had sold it to Facebook for $3 billion. You were working on the future of virtual reality. And now you have hard pivoted towards defense technology, um, although you're still wearing the Hawaiian Tropic shirt, so nothing's changed since then. I'm still the same person. Still the with same. With the same clothes. Um, why the pivot? <laughs> so during my time at Oculus, and even prior to Oculus, when I worked in an Army-funded research lab, I really became concerned that the United States was falling behind in really key critical areas, especially with regards to technology. And when I left Oculus, it was more apparent than ever that the traditional defense contractors, who are really good at building things like better fighter jets, bigger submarines, bigger aircraft carriers, were not well equipped to build the technology that was going to matter for the future of warfare, particularly autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, and human computer interaction and transhumanism. And it was also abundantly clear that the technologies that were equipped with the technology and the tools and the talent to make it different in this space were largely refusing to work with the defense sector. They were refusing to work on defense technology. And especially since that is kind of a unique thing in, I think, the US and maybe the rest of the West, certainly not a problem that is in Russia or China, I wanted to start a company where really smart people could work on national security problems and work on the technology that is going to keep our values safe. So take us to the future. Um, what does that technology look like? Let's look at the future of war. Paint a picture. What are soldiers doing? How, like, give us the most high-tech, Palmer Lucky <laughs> view of the future of war. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing about most war is that it's largely even not even about fighting. It's largely about stability and peacekeeping and rebuilding, and of course, yes, combat. Uh, but like, what we're working on is taking data from lots of different sensors, putting it into an AI-powered sensor fusion platform so that you can basically build a perfect 3D model of everything that's going on in a large area. And then we can take that data and run predictive and analytics on it and tag everything with metadata, find what's relevant, and then push it to people who are out in the field in real time through mobile devices and heads-up displays. Like, I guess, practically speaking, in the future, I think soldiers are going to be superheroes who have the power of perfect omniscience over their area of operations, where they know where every single enemy is, where every friend is, where every asset is. I also think it's very unlikely that soldiers in the future are going to directly carry weapons. It's most likely going to be the domain of other systems that they're tied into, uh, so that we're not putting people directly in harm's way, where they're the ones that are actually not only you know, taking the shots, but uh, also making the shots. So they'll actually have these VR, these headsets of sorts. Yeah, I, I think that every soldier in the world is going to be wearing an augmented, rea augmented reality heads-up display a long time before every consumer is wearing an augmented reality heads-up display. Uh, the, the advantages are just so much greater. For, like, for the consumer sector, AR can't really take off until there's a reason to wear something on your head every day, and it has to be so much better than your smartphone for it people to be interested in doing that. Uh, but if you can like, if you can be a 5% better Twitter experience or a 5% better navigation experience, that's not enough to get people to wear a headset in the consumer space. But uh, in the defense space, if you can make soldiers and other war fighters even 5% more effective, then it's absolutely worth doing. And I think it's actually more than that. I think it's more like 200 or 300% effectivity increases when you can intuitively understand where every threat is, where the safe places are, where the dangerous places are, where your own assets are, and see that augmented directly into your view of the battlefield. So how does that look when you talk about the augment, this in, you're able to see what? Kind of paint that. Sure. I mean, like, you, you should be able to see where all of the other people in your unit are. You should see that highlighted in your view. You should see where the enemy is. You should see when potential threats are popping up that you would not have even known about, even if they're on the other side of a building or on the other side of the hill. Essentially, giving people x-ray vision through the power of a single common operating picture that is fed to each soldier on the battlefield through this heads-up display. And this is a type of advantage that we can have if we build a really strong technological base and that the United States can share with its allies so that we have a lot of the same technology working on the same networks that a lot of our 
adversaries are going to have a hard time competing with. And so take me to the actual products you are building at this moment. This is a very, that's a very forward-thinking sure. look. So what is Underall? I actually visited recently. You guys are outside of LA, and it's almost just like this warehouse, and you guys, there's like a helipad at the top. It's a very interesting space. You guys are actually working on putting technology to market. What exactly does that look like? So our core product is something called Lattice which is a sensor fusion platform that uses artificial intelligence to fuse data from hundreds or thousands of different sensors, mounted on vehicles, drones, fixed towers, and even people, into a single cohesive real-time 3D model of large battle spaces. And then we can run all kinds of analysis on that model and use machine learning to tag everything in that model with metadata. So you know where all the people are, you know where all the vehicles are, you know where all the drones are, you know where all the threats are. And then we take that and we pipe it out to people in the field. So uh, this is not hypothetical. It's not something that we want to build someday. We've actually had a ton of success. Uh, we're deployed around several military bases. We're deployed in multiple spots along the US border. Uh, we're deployed around some other infrastructure I can't talk about. Uh, but we're actually out there applying artificial intelligence to these problems and giving operators perfect situational awareness in the areas where they're operating. And that's something that nobody's ever built up to this point. The idea of putting a heads-up display in a computer and a network onto uh, Soldier has been around for a very long time, uh, but the biggest problem hasn't been the hardware, it's been the back end. There's never been a source of data to push to that heads up display, and we're building that and allowing people to do what people do best and machines to do what people, what, what machines do best, which is fusing all the sensor data, knowing everything that's going on, and then elevating the relevant information to people. It's been controversial, a little bit controversial in the States because the headline is that you're building the wall, the digital wall for Donald Trump. So what's your response uh, to that? And what ethically have you thought about as you're building out this technology when it comes to the border with, uh, you know, with the divisiveness we have and with the current administration? Well, I think a lot of people in the United States disagree on immigration policy, but very few people disagree with the concept of border security, especially in government. Most people agree we don't want unchecked sex trafficking and weapons trafficking and drug trafficking. And certainly the right way to build a better immigration policy is not to have no idea what's happening on the US border. So I, I think you kind of have to separate the two. People think that because immigration policy is controversial, therefore border security must also not be bipartisan, when in fact there's broad bipartisan secure everywhere except for in a radical fringe. Uh, the other side is when you're thinking about these ethical problems, you have to think about them not just in the context of what's happening in the US. Like the, you know, the way, reason you're asking that is uh, you know, fairly a little bit US-centric, where we think about the ethics of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems as if, if the United States does not work on these things, progress will just stop until we figure out what's going on and the best way to move forward. But that's not the case. Russia and China are already working on these same types of technologies. In many ways, they're moving faster than us. They have their best people working on a lot of these things. Vladimir Putin had a really good quote when he was talking to people in Russia, trying to get them to work in the defense industry. And he was speaking about artificial intelligence. And he said, uh, he who wins in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. So he's obviously thinking about the ethics of artificial intelligence in a very different way. And so when tech companies in the United States take a position on this stuff, they have to realize that taking no position at all is basically ceding the argument to China and Russia and other adversaries who don't think about ethics the same way and don't have the same values that the US and its allies do. So what would be your message? Google recently, Google employees recently protested uh, the company working with the Pentagon on artificial intelligence and they ended up not doing it. Um, what would be your message to Google? So, I mean, th that's an interesting example because you're right. There were a few thousand employees who were upset about Google's work with the Pentagon. But I think actually most Google employees recognize that that program was a good thing, that it was going to lead to less collateral damage and fewer civilian deaths. And you have a very loud minority that is kind of seen as speaking for the company only because they stand up and shout, I speak for this company. They do not speak for the company. Most of even Silicon Valley believes that it's better for the West to have the best defense technology than to let Russia and China lead in that space and to dictate the ethics of that space and to write the rules of how that space works in the same way that the US led uh, in nuclear arms. And I think this small group that's against that is actually a little bit taking a short-term view on the problem and also being very American-centric, believing that if they don't work on the problem, that the problem will go away. And it's interesting because you, I mean, you essentially got pushed out of Facebook for uh, various reasons we don't have to get into. Um, but I think a lot of 
people, you hear there's a culture war playing out in Silicon Valley, and a lot of people talk to you in ways they wouldn't speak out publicly. So what are you hearing with employees behind the scenes in Silicon Valley uh, about how this is all playing out? Well, I mean, a little, like I said before, I think most employees in Silicon Valley believe in Western values. They believe in liberal democracy, strong rule of law, checks and balances, and thinking ethically about this technology. It's a very small minority that is against the US leading in sectors like autonomy and AI into the defense sector. And what I'm hearing from most people is that they don't want to speak up about this because it's so controversial. But that doesn't mean that the people don't want to work on it. And I, I think because of that, you're going to see more and more people as time goes on realizing they do have to take a stand and work on defense technology. And in fact, just work broadly on things that may not be popular. And they may not be part of the zeitgeist. They may not be the hottest thing that everyone's talking about at Web Summit, whichever year it is. Uh, but they are still important. People have to work on important problems even when there are people who won't like that you work on them. So ethically, where will you draw the line? I, I mean, is there, you take us to this headquarters, right? Have you guys had certain discussions about what you will not do? So I mean, uh, in a, in, that's not really totally up to us in that we are working with the US government. And I generally believe that the US government especially the US military makes better decisions when it has better information. I mean, when the United States has a pretty good history of doing the right thing when it's able to. And obviously, we've made mistakes. We're not perfect. But I do believe that we're much, much better than a lot of these other countries. And I think that you'll also see a lot of companies saying, you know, here's where we draw the line. Uh, here's what the policy should be. Here's what we're going to allow the government to do or not do. And I don't think that's generally the place of Silicon Valley companies. They shouldn't be telling the government what their policy is. You know, build technology, advocate for policy, don't try to tell the government what their policy is going to be, and certainly don't try to control policy by refusing to give the government the best tools and by giving the military the best tools. I mean, if you want to change immigration policy, the best way to change that is to change immigration policy, not to deny Department of Homeland Security the technology they need to enforce the laws that are on the book. And the same thing with the military. If you don't like what the military is doing in a particular operation, the right thing to do is speak out about that, not to say they shouldn't have weapons or they shouldn't have tools that are going to keep them safe. I was speaking to Tony Blair and uh, Microsoft's Brad Smith yesterday, and he said we need to regulate facial recognition technology before the year 2025 looks like the book 1984. So are you guys going to build out that type of technology? And if so, what do you think, what kind of regulation do you think would be needed? Are you thinking about that in, in any specific way? We're thinking about it, but I mean, that's, it's, we're thinking about what the implications are. Like, we're not building domestic security technology. We're not trying to build urban security technology. We're focused on classifying like classifying and detecting things, not identifying them to specific identities. So we want to be able to say, hey, there's five people in this area that are not supposed to be there, and they're a threat, and they're armed. We want to push that information out. We're not trying to say, oh, it, you know, that's Palmer, and that's Lori, and here's, their, their, here's everything they've purchased recently. Here's everything that they've, uh, here's all the phone calls that they made recently. And where you are seeing that is places in, like in China, where you're seeing in their private sector and in the government sector mass urban civilian tracking of every single person. And they're using that information from these tech companies to persecute people and lock them up in re-education camps. I mean, to me, that you kind of have to, again, look at this in a global perspective and realize that the biggest threats are not going to be Western democracies abusing this technology. It's going to be our adversaries abusing our technologies. And that's where tech companies should be focusing, I think, their outrage and their effort, and hopefully allow themselves to get motivated by that to work on these things here. Do you think we're at risk in the United States and Europe of losing global supremacy when it comes to tech innovation? Yes. I mean, the, pe people sometimes will point at places like China and say, aha, look at them. They're not a real military. They don't have a blue water navy. They only have one aircraft carrier, and they bought it from the Russians. But that's because they're smart. They understand that they're not going to win the next war with the tools that won the last few wars. They understand how to invest in autonomy and artificial intelligence and drones. Vladimir Putin understands this uh, intimately as well. And so I think that the United States is really good at building iterative technology and building better versions of what won the last war. But I think that we really struggle at building things that are going to win the next generation. And that's on an institutional level. That's on a, the, the way that the contracting system works. Uh, but that's why I started Onderil, is because I wanted there to be a place for smart people to solve these defense problems and work on autonomous systems and artificial intelligence and the tools that are going to define the next generation of warfare. Are you having trouble recruiting? No. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, like, like I've, I've said it a few times, but uh, I think most people in the West 
want the West to have the best defense technology. And like, obviously, we're not going to recruit that vocal minority that th would rather have the US military armed with sticks. But there's not that many of those people in the grand scheme of things. Would you, so, so who would you not do business with? Would you not do business with China? No. I, I, mean, I wouldn't do business with China. I wouldn't do business with Russia. I would not do business with a lot of their close allies and probably even half-hearted allies. Uh, we're 100% we're focused on building tools for the United States and for our Western allies who believe in freedom and democracy and human rights and everything that comes with it. Uh, what do you think? Um, what do you think about this idea of a digital Geneva Convention? There's the kind of talk here uh, about you know Europe, the United States coming together for a digital Geneva co Convention to create some kind of rules of what we will do. Do you think that'll make any difference? I think that things like that are only as applicable as the intentions of the people who abide by them. Like th that's not really going to solve the problem. Like I have. I have no hopes that a digital Geneva Convention, whatever it would be, would prevent China from using surveillance tools to watch every citizen in their country. I have very little confidence that it's going to prevent Russia from building autonomous systems that can acquire and fire on targets without any kind of human in intervention whatsoever. Like, that, that's just not probably going to happen. Uh, when you... And, actually, adding on to that, like, one of the reasons that it is so important for the US and its allies to lead in this space is because if you want to define the rules, like kind of what you're talking about, you have to lead first. The United States never would have been able to define the rules around the use of nuclear arms if we didn't have any and our adversaries did. You can't just be equal with people if you want to lead the discussion. You have to be the leader. Uh, like, technological superiority is a prerequisite for ethical superiority. And that's why one of the reasons it's so important that we're not just equals to these other places, that we're so far ahead that we can actually not just be one of the seats at the table, but the, the main seat at the table. Um, and why does your background in gaming, do you think, help with what you're trying to build? Because what you did with Oculus and virtual reality was revolutionary at the time, hence why you guys were able to sell for $3 billion to Facebook. So how does this background in gaming help with more technology? So I, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's less the gaming and more kind of the technology behind it. Like, one of the reasons that virtual reality took off in the gaming space before anywhere else is because the gaming space was the only industry with the technology and the tools and the talent to build real-time immersive 3D worlds. I'm having deja vu because I think I said almost exactly that phrase at Web Summit four years ago. Right. Um, but as time went on, you're, you were starting to see that same types of technology being used in education and being used in the military and being used in the medical industry. And I think that you're starting to see this some of the defense industry. Like the, the technology that you need to do to network a bunch of people together with very low latency and take lots of data and fuse it into a single cohesive place and you know, put that data all back out to people, it's actually largely similar to what you need to build to do something like this. So there's actually a lot of technological similarities focused around really, really low latency and really, really good fusion of data. When you talk about the future of war and you know, AR and VR headsets and all this type of thing, it almost feels like gaming to a degree. So as these worlds uh, merge, as gaming and war begins to merge, are you worried about dehumanizing war? This is something that's you know, not new. We've had this conversation with drone technology for a long time, but are you thinking at all about whether we dehumanize war? So I, I think people have brought that up a few times, and I think that's looking at it the wrong way. Like the concept of heads-up displays or uh, you know targeting reticles, all these things that are staples of the games industry, they come from the defense industry. Like long before anyone was playing Call of Duty, we had all of this stuff in our attack helicopters and in our fighter jets. So gaming has kind of borrowed a lot from the defense space, but this is really just accelerating what's been going on in the defense space all the time. Like if you put a heads-up display on a soldier that tells him where every enemy is and allows him to never be ambushed and to always be safe. We've had that type of technology on fighter jets for many decades now. It's not coming from the games industry. It's a natural evolution of really the defense industry. And the game stuff, like, I, I think on the surface, people are most familiar with games if they're a consumer. But if they think it's coming from the games industry, it's because they're not as familiar with how this technology has already been broadly deployed in the military. So I think it's, it's not really taking it closer to games. It's really just continuing on the same path it's always been on. Um, let's take like a giant step back. Looking forward, I mean, what do you think is the single most important issue we're facing when it comes to, ethically, when it comes to the future of technology and humanity? 
the single most important if you, issue. If you had to pick one, because there's a lot, we've heard a lot of issues at Web Summit that we have kind of going forward. What, do you, what for you is, is the thing we really need to pay attention to? I mean, we've spoken about this before. I'm a big optimist on technology. And we, we, we've talked about how in science fiction, so often technology is portrayed as this doomsday technology. Or there's like one thing or another is going to crush us all. And I think that the reality is actually pretty boring. Like, Society is going to continue to get better. Technology is going to continue to get better. We'll have little stumbles along the way. But fundamentally, the nature of humanity is not going to change too much. I think we're going to get through all of this stuff. Um, but if you had to pick one? If I had to pick one? If I had to pick one. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a crazy nutter who believes that virtual reality is going to be an inevitable technology and that we're going to spend huge portions of our lives in virtual environments and augmented environments at some point within our lifetime. I worry about a time in the future where people are spending a huge amount of time in virtual spaces and do not have the ability to talk about certain ideas or the ability to really have any concept of free speech. You know, I worry about a world where we have a hypothetical right of free speech in meat space out in the real world huh. and that that right doesn't matter because very few people even spend most of their time there. And I, I, I worry about that, but I also think that worry is happening on a timeline that's so long, and I'm pretty confident we're going to solve those problems long before, before it's any kind of doomsday. Um, last question, because we've got to wrap it. Uh, you sold around like when you were 17 years old, or you, you started Oculus when you were around 17. So you're 26 now? That's right. OK. Um, this makes me feel old. But who, so who is 17-year-old Palmer Lucky compared to 26-year-old Palmer Lucky? Let's see. 17-year-old Palmer Lucky had a lot more time to spend playing video games. Uh, and I think 17-year-old Palmer Lucky was also a lot more kind of American-centric in the way that I was looking at problems. You know, I, I assumed that a lot of our biggest problems were here in the United States or here with our own government or here with our own corporations. As time went on and as I started to get more experience with what was going on around the world, I realized that a lot of the biggest problems were entirely outside of the United States. And, the only way that there was were going to get solved is if I thought about problem solving in a way that included those problems and didn't just focus on building, building things here in the US. And I'd say the, the biggest change has been realizing that there's a lot of problems out there that are not popular that need to be solved. And we need smart people to work on those problems too. I, I, you know, especially here at Web Summit, you, there's, there's a lot of people here talking about what the hot thing is, what the hypiest thing is, what's the coolest thing, whether it's machine learning or you know, health monitoring or uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and a lot of people are not talking about the unpopular things that aren't really easy to talk about. And I think that those are going to be some of the most important problems in the world to solve, and that there's going to be more and more people solving those problems. Awesome. Thank you, Palmer. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone.